Welcome back to another episode of Southern Utah University's Teaching and Learning Podcast. I'm your host, Matt McKenzie. And in this episode, we're gonna explore a topic that's being widely discussed, not only at SUU, but across higher education, and that's academic freedom and free speech. Joining me in today's episode are professors Bree Kramer and Kelly Goonan. So let's dig in and see what academic freedom and free speech mean with these two professors. Welcome back to another episode of SUU's Center for Teaching Innovations Teaching and Learning Podcast. I'm here with two guests today to talk about academic freedom and free speech. Would you two like to introduce yourselves? Hi, I'm Kelly Goonan. I am an associate professor of outdoor recreation and parks and tourism and recently served as the faculty senate president at SUU. And I'm Dr. Bree Kramer. I'm an associate professor in the College of Education and Human Development. Okay. So it, it's really interesting to me. Uh, I'm, I'm from a staff perspective, right? Mm -hmm. But I've grown up in education, taught K-12, did some higher ed stuff. I'm now mm -hmm. here at SUU, which is, I guess, still a higher ed stuff, right? But the, the whole idea of academic freedom and free speech in the classroom, how does that... Trans how do faculty translate that into their curriculum? Or first, I guess, how do you define it? I mean, let's just start with that because I, I depending on who you talk to, it's a whole different conversation, right? Yeah. So SU goes by the AAUP definition of academic freedom in our policy, which is in policy for all faculty to look at. But loosely described, it's the faculty member has the choice of academic course materials, um, teaching materials, how they structure their course, um, things like that. They have the rights to identify their own scholarship style, um, what they study, how they study it um, within the confines of their discipline, most likely. Um, and then they can participate in service opportunities that speak to them, um, whatever those look like, both inside and outside of the, the institution. And I think what's really important about academic freedom is that it gives faculty that ability to pursue their interests and advance the knowledge within their discipline. And so with scholarship and creative activity, that's where a lot of that advancement happens. And then we bring that back into the classroom and incorporate that into our curriculum and, and course materials. And that's where the interface with, with students. And I think it's also important to note that students also have some level of academic freedom, right? They um, can investigate topics that they're interested in and really kind of poke and prod to further the intellectual conversation around a, a particular topic. That, that's a great way to put it. When we push and pull on these topics and we bring the research back and we're doing research with students because a lot of faculty actually research with students. I know my son, Aaron, um, with Dr. Lawrence did a ton of research, mm -hmm. um, together, not just, Oh, go out and research a topic, write a paper, but like real research. When we're having these conversations with our students, what do you, what steps do you take to make sure that they feel comfortable with their academic freedom. Because I think that's something that's often missed. We often talk about academic freedom, free speech for faculty and staff, but not always with students. I think the biggest thing is making sure students understand that their voice is important regardless of what it is that they're sharing or what, regardless of what it is that they're saying. Um, because so many times they, and, and students have talked to me about this, I teach in the master's program now, and so I largely have graduate students. Um, and so a lot of times they say, well, you know, I, I was hesitant to say this because it sounds like I might be going against what a lot of other people in the class are saying about this particular reading or this particular point or whatever. But those viewpoints are very important because I, I would hope <laughs> that no professor really goes in saying this is exactly what I, the knowledge I want my students to walk out with. Every student coming into that class brings in their own knowledge that they've already built. They bring in their own experiences, and that helps shape their own learning. And we can't mold that for them because we don't know what those experiences or what those what those um 
you know, life pieces have been walking into our classroom. So they're going to make out of our curriculum what they take out of it. And, and it might not always align with like our goals and objectives as an instructor, but I think that that's okay. I think that it's important for the student's voice and the student's knowledge to come through very clearly um, and to let them know that um, I don't personally, as an instructor, have an agenda for exactly what I want them to connect with, what I want them to agree with, what I want them to disagree with. I think any conversation that we can have about the material in the class is going to be a generative conversation, whether that means that half their peers disagree with them or agree with them. It doesn't really matter. Um, it's that they're doing the analysis, they're doing the work, they're thinking through, they're building new understandings. And regardless of what those are, when they walk out with them, that's what makes a successful learning experience for the student. And I think it makes a su successful learning experience that the instructors created as well. And I think with your example about doing research with students, there are a lot of steps that go into that. The first is it's really important for them to understand the research process. They yeah. need to understand how to find the background information, how to synthesize that information, find kind of those threads of maybe common understanding or key principles or concepts in the field, and also to find those gaps. Because I think what Bree is saying here about asking different questions and taking a different perspective, that's really where um, research becomes almost a, a creative activity too. And having that faculty guidance in the process and then giving the students the freedom to say, this is something that I think is really interesting and I want to dig a little bit deeper into it. And then teaching students, I, I fully agree with Bree what she said about um, the student's voice is really important. And I think a lot of times students are afraid to disagree with a faculty member or to raise a counterpoint or different perspective. And yeah. part of <laughs> academic freedom, I, I think we can't have academic freedom unless we also create safe learning environments in our classroom and cultivate those relationships where it's okay for us to have different perspectives and we actually encourage that. And we want to have respectful dialogue and I'm not trying to change anybody's mind or change what they value or think is important. I'm just asking them to consider other people's perspectives and other people's experiences and to understand that, as, as Brie mentioned, we're all coming in with a unique perspective on something. And if we contribute those perspectives together, we actually come out with something a lot richer than if we're only presenting one particular perspective. And, and you bring up a great point of that research process and having them go back and find out what does the research say before we do this study? Mm. You know, it's not, oh, I just saw this post on Facebook, so therefore it must be true, right? Um, and I think of that great meme of like Abraham Lincoln, Lincoln saying something about the effect of uh, if it's on the internet, it's true or something like that, you know? Um, but, but that's a great point. We have to take our students back and we have to say, let's talk about how did we get to this point? How did we get to this understanding so that we can take that further? Um, you both brought up a great point that our students, and, and I'm curious how you each handle this because you, you're both in different fields, mm -hmm. but group think is a real thing mm -hmm. with, with learning. And that's true of adults and true of students. How do you combat group think when a student's afraid to put up a differing opinion because so many other people, and I teach a lot of online courses, so I guess I should preface it with that. I teach a lot of online courses, so a student may not get to the discussion until after there's several posts already supporting one mm -hmm. viewpoint. How do you combat group think and get those students to provide that alternative perspective? So I teach online as well, but I teach more a little hybrid. Um, async I, they do d asynchronous discussions, but then we have the Zoom sessions in person um, on uh, or 
I guess, in person as hybrid as they can be, right? Um, and so in the discussion boards, uh, and I even did this with undergrads, um, so this is not just reserved for graduate students, but I would have my graduates or my students sign up for weeks to lead the discussion. And they could pose whatever question they wanted um, from the readings, from the curriculum materials. So that could be videos, multimedia. Um, you know, obviously there were readings every week, but they could pose a question from anything um, that they connected with. So as long as it was rooted in what we were studying, what we were learning about that week, um, they, you know, their voice came in and the way that they crafted their question, the way that they asked it, what they asked their peers about the question. Um, and then in the responses, they had to cite material from the class responses or from the classroom materials as well. And so I think that helps that dialogue so that no one feels constrained in terms of, I have to speak this way, or I have to create a question that's positive about the curriculum materials, they could totally, and a lot of my students have, crafted questions that were very critical of some of the curriculum pieces. And right, you know, that's a great way to look at something is through critique. And so that's uh, that piece of uh, student academic freedom is really important. And then in the Zoom sessions, when we're live, um, you can always guess, right, by the by the discussion, how anything's going either in person or, or on Zoom based on the responses that are being given, based on how students are, are talking about perhaps an answer, providing examples for a certain question, um, the way it's going. So I always make sure to ask, like, does anyone have an opposing view? Does anyone have a, a different idea that they'd like to contribute to this conversation? Does anyone have a different experience that they with this topic than what your peers have shared? And I think that that's very important to do because even when, we, when it seems like somebody you know, or that everybody agrees on something, um, there's going to be someone that has a different experience or a different um, thought about the situation that we might be talking about. And especially since I teach current teachers, everybody's got a different thought on things yeah. and has different experiences. So it's really important for them to bring those out um, in the conversation. And so if they don't do that on their own, that's really when the instructor should start asking those types of questions. And honestly, as the instructor, I stay out of their discussion boards. I do not insert myself in the discussion boards. I allow them to have their asynchronous discussions. Um, you know, I will monitor them, I will grade them, uh, but I do not interject anything in them. Um, I allow them to have their conversations on their own. And then in our Zoom sessions, I have the students bring questions or topics that they would like to discuss. I don't come in with an agenda as an instructor. Um, I will answer students' questions once everybody else has said, well, you know, we didn't really get to the root of an answer. Can you synthesize like what we've talked about? I will go ahead and do that. But I don't come in with an agenda as an instructor of this is the type of discussion that we want to have. And so I think those types of things are great in creating those spaces both online and either in person or in that hybrid mode for students to feel comfortable um, getting their feet wet with maybe providing a dissenting view or a different opinion or an alternative um, piece of information that, that they've experienced. I think it's important for faculty to really clearly set the tone and expectation at the very beginning of a course. Um, I teach a mix of online and face-to-face -face classes, and I use Canvas for all of them, and I make it very, very clear up front on the first day that um, your grade is not going to be affected if you disagree with me or with something that I present. I may ask you to provide evidence and citations and you know information to back up your argument, but you're never going to be penalized for disagreeing. Um, I have classroom guidelines to encourage open and honest discussion, um, and I... I spend a good bit of time talking about those just classroom climate guidelines. Um, and then in my field, it's kind of become a joke with me and my students that the correct answer is always it depends because <laughs> context is so important. Mm -hmm. So I teach in outdoor recreation. We, we have concepts and frameworks and principles just like any other discipline, but how those get applied in a specific setting is so dependent on the historical context, the political context, the ecological context, 
so many other things that what works in one location, we can definitely look at it and model, but we can't necessarily just pick it up and apply it in a different setting. And so I say that to my students all the time. And by the time they graduate, they always say, well, it depends. But then they go further to explain and say, in this situation, based on this set of context, this is how I would approach this particular issue, and this is why. And I think one of the best examples of that is um, an assignment that I had in a recreation resources management class a few years ago where students worked in groups to create a resource management plan. And they all worked on the same national park. We used Capitol Reef as kind of our, our case study. Uh, four of the five groups chose dark night skies as the resource or value that they wanted to protect. And all four of them chose different methods to monitor the quality of dark night skies. All four groups chose slightly different indicators and slightly different thresholds. And they were all, quote unquote, right. Because they, they used proper methods. They demonstrated that they understood the framework and the principles involved. And they justified their recommendations and, and were able to, to show that. And that was something that I, I intentionally paused and pointed out to the class to say, look, we have four groups who chose the same thing and they all approached it differently and they all did it right. So how can you have multiple right answers to one situation? And I think that really helps the students see, oh, it is okay to approach. There are valid ways to approach um, the same topic from, from multiple perspectives. Because I think, at, at least when I get students in my GE class and, and my lower level classes, they're so worried about being right mm -hmm. that they're, they're afraid to express different opinions or to ask questions that might be a little bit. And so I, I think faculty can really set the tone in their class and, and model that for their students in a variety of ways that are appropriate to their discipline. Yeah. I, I sometimes will go back and play devil's advocate once in a while mm -hmm. with my discussions. Um, I'm kind of the same way. I let my yep. students lead those discussions and I only get involved when someone's going way off track. <laughs> but sometimes if the discussions like yep. turns into that, I agree, I agree. I'll be like, well, I, I don't. And here's why. Mm -hmm. Now tell me why I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's fun to do that. You, you've both brought this up and Kelly, you, you mentioned it almost specifically about creating that culture or that environment in the classroom that allows for this disagreement to allow students and faculty to have that academic freedom to push and pull. When you think about that, what do you see as one of the most key factors in establishing that? And I'm going to use a strategic plan word here, that culture of caring um, or enriching that academic experience of a student. How do you, what are some of those really top things that a faculty member here at SU or anyone listening could implement to create that environment? I think, again, just being really explicit with what is the climate or the culture that you want to create in your classroom. Um, most faculty don't want to just sit and lecture to a silent room, right? They want students to be engaged. They want students to ask questions. They want them to be interested. And so really being explicit in your syllabus and your course introduction about this is the way the class is going to run. These are the kinds of activities we're going to do. Um, this is what I'm expecting of you. And I always tell my students, one of the reasons that I enjoy teaching so much is I always learn something new. Even if I've been teaching the same class multiple times a year for 10 years, because of the people in that class, and also just because our knowledge is always evolving, I always come away with something different. And um, I put a lot of emphasis on those group activities because number one in real life, at least in my field, you're never gonna be working as an individual. You're always gonna be working as a part of a team where everybody brings their own unique expertise and then collaborates to achieve a particular goal. Um, I also think I'm pretty smart. 
You are. I think you my student. I think my students are really smart, mm-hmm. and. I try to encourage them and say, I have knowledge that I can share with you, and I have experience that I can share with you, but you have experience and knowledge that you can share with everybody in this classroom, too, right? It shouldn't just be Dr. Goonan being the source of all information. It should be the collective group in that classroom. And I think being explicit in that and kind of setting that tone it gets the students excited because they feel like they have something to contribute and that they're not just there to take something from the class. And I think that's where you can really get students a lot more engaged and they start asking more of those really deep, critical, thought-provoking questions that we want our students to be able to ask. I, I like that. That reminds me, I was just reading a book about professional learning communities and the principal in the K-12 building changed their name their, their job title to head learner mm-hmm. to establish the idea that we're all learning. So I, that, that's what made me, that's what ran through my head when you're like, yeah, we, we need to understand we're all learning and it's a journey together. So you think that? I think the other thing that I would add to what Kelly said is building relationships is really important because when students feel And I I hesitate to use the word comfortable because we have to understand that some students are never going to feel comfortable in in certain spaces or certain classrooms. So I'm going to use that word, but there's like a little asterisk at the end of it. Um, And I think that's important for faculty and staff to remember as well. Um, But I think it's all about developing those relationships, the the faculty's relationship with the students, the students' relationship with their peers. Um, And in a graduate, in our graduate program, it's seven week classes. And so it's it's a challenge, right, to build those relationships, although they might spend all their program for the next two years with the same uh, cohort of students or group of students, even though we don't use really technically use a cohort model. Um, but if you're in teaching in a major field that like Kelly described, those students probably will have classes together. And so it's really important for us to help them develop those relationships, understand what that looks like, especially between faculty and student, because a lot of times, depending on whether we teach those really low level undergraduate classes, that faculty and and student dynamic might look a little different than the upper levels where you're teaching like the major courses that students really are really honed in on to graduate, or if you're teaching in the graduate program, those relationships are going to look a little bit different too between faculty and students, or if you're doing research with students, those relationships are a little different as well. And so really teaching students like what those look like, how they can maximize the time that they spend with the faculty member, with their peers, um, and, and really engage well with each other. And I think, you know, you mentioned that you have inf- important information that you need to share just like they do. And I think that once you've established those relationships, then you can say as a faculty member or a student can say, this is my opinion, but it's tied to this material that we're looking at or this topic this week. And here's what I have to say about it. And even if people disagree, I don't think faculty need to be worried that all of a sudden they're going to get a comment on their evaluation, you know, that like hammers them or, you know, something like that, because we understand that that's what the relationship is, that that we are trying to create a scholarly community at any level that we're teaching. And we need to model what those relationships look like when we're working between scholars that maybe like faculty have been in the field for a really long time or students that are just entering the field at whatever level they're in. And so that scholarly community with academic freedom is very different when we change that topic to free speech. Mm-hmm. How does academic freedom differ from free speech? So free speech is tailored to the individual. Um, so academic freedom is your freedom in your position here at the institution or your position as a student. Uh, but your free speech is your individual right. Um, So I can speak as an individual in certain spaces, but I cannot always speak um, as an academic representing SUU in every space. And so I think sometimes those two things get conflated. Students sometimes, uh, especially thinking about K-12 and also into higher ed, may have some free speech rights that are different than what faculty have, for sure. Maybe they extend farther in certain spaces um, because faculty have that academic freedom piece and policy. Um, and but that's really kind of the distinction is the individual piece. Uh, first, the f- free speech is going to protect the individual everywhere, um, but academic freedom is going to protect us in the institution. Yeah, I I agree with that, and I think maybe one thing to 
to kind of help illustrate that is academic freedom protects faculty within the the context of our research and our teaching. Mm -hmm. And it's not always appropriate for me to bring something into the classroom if it's not related to the learning objectives of that class. So again, teaching in outdoor recreation, I might talk about um, maybe some historic barriers to access to recreation for different groups. Uh, for example, right now there's a lot of emphasis and attention on increasing accessibility for people with physical disabilities in outdoor recreation spaces. Everything from how we design trails to parking areas to the kinds of information that we, we provide online so that people can plan their trips. That's perfectly relevant for me to bring into a class. Um, but maybe another point of, of debate or another topic that's not related to that. Um, for example, it might not be relevant for me to talk about um, the worthiness of different economic policies in a class, right? If it's not relevant to the learning outcomes or the, the goals of the class, I think that's the line that people should be aware of between free speech and your right to express your opinion, um, but also the integrity that as faculty we ought to maintain in our classrooms with that protection of academic freedom, making sure that what we are doing with students both in the classroom and in a research setting is related to the academic goals of the student and the the purpose of the class, the the learning outcomes of the course. And I think it's important to remember that all programs have the program outcomes. I know that within CTI, when we help design a course, we're aligning objectives horizontally and vertically. We're saying, okay, if you're doing this activity, what are they? What module objective are they supposed to obtain? And then that module objective, what course outcome are they supposed to obtain? And that course outcome, what program outcome are they obtaining? Mm -hmm. So I think it's important that that's, if I understand it, what you're saying correctly, that's where the difference lies between academic freedom, which is making sure it aligns with those objectives that are supposed to be part of the course versus a personal belief you're bringing in. Mm -hmm. So as we, we go forward at SUU, and in higher education as a whole, what are some key things you want faculty to remember about these two concepts uh, as they teach, as they interact uh, with their colleagues, as they interact with students, community members? What, what do you want faculty to take away from this? I know that a lot of faculty are really concerned with the environment that we find ourselves in right now, um, just globally. And I think it's really important. It's the same thing that I tell my current teachers or that I told my pre-service teachers. You need to know your policy. First of all, you need to read the policy on academic freedom. You really should be reading all of the policies, all of the six point policies tailored to faculty as well, um, tailored to research, all of those. We, we need to know those as faculty. Um, we need to know those in and out. Um, e even so the policies of what we're allowed to do with university equipment. Absolutely. Like, what can I send from my <laughs> SU email? Absolutely. What can I do on my university That's issued right. laptop, right? That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. So know your policies, tie everything back to those course standards, those course objectives. Um, every, every institute, every department, every subject has their own accreditation. So, you know, know your accreditation standards, what you need to tie those back to. Um, and really, take to heart what students have shared in the past as well. So if you're, you know, in the past, if it feels like maybe students have said that you're coming off one way about a topic, see what you can do to, and it's not always going to be a perfect balance. I, I you know, I, I completely acknowledge that. Um, but think about their perspective when you're planning your classes or maybe reorganizing some things. Um, I think that's one of the biggest takeaways that, that faculty could utilize as well as the other two that I mentioned. I think along with knowing our policies, I get the sense that with the current political climate, a lot of faculty are feeling a little bit chilled and mm -hmm. they're nervous about discussing any kind of topic that could 
potentially be viewed as quote unquote controversial or sensitive. And I think it's really, really important that faculty remember that they do have academic freedom, that the university, the state protects faculty's academic freedom and our ability to pursue the kinds of research and creative activities and service activities that speak to us, given our own unique personal interests and the discipline that we're part of. And that also gives us the freedom to teach our students in the way that we feel will best prepare them to become future professionals in the field. And I don't want faculty to pull back on anything that they're doing because they're nervous. Um, we have a lot of really great resources at SUU. Uh, knowing the policies is definitely a great place to start. Utilizing resources like the Faculty Senate or the Staff Association for Staff. Um, I have found folks across the university to be incredibly receptive when I have questions about something or need some clarification. And so I hope that faculty will not diminish what they're doing in the classroom and continue to serve their students in the best way that, that they're able to. Um, and part of that means exposing them to controversial topics that they may have to deal with when they're working professionals out in the field. Because if we can teach them here in a somewhat safe, structured environment how to navigate those kinds of challenging topics, they're going to be better prepared when they inevitably encounter those kinds of challenges when they become professionals. And I think the other thing that I would like faculty and staff to know about is, um, or to remember, is that if they are really passionate about something, get involved. There are so many different ways to get involved, um, either professionally or personally. And if you ever have questions about what is a professional activity versus what is a personal activity or something that I'm really passionate about, um, again, utilizing those resources to understand how to engage in a way that doesn't blur those lines between your professional and your personal advocacy or, or academic freedom and free speech. Um, I just hope that conversations don't stop because people feel afraid. And, and like you said earlier, it, this is a journey. We're, we're learning how to navigate this new global reality of higher education being under attack to an extent, mm -hmm. especially in certain areas. And we're going to make mistakes, but it, it's going to be important to do that. Thank you both, Kelly, Bree. Thank you both for taking the time to meet with me today to talk about academic freedom, free speech. I, I have zero doubt we could sit here for another couple of hours and discuss this um, because it is such a big topic and, and complicated topic. Um, and so we may have to have you guys back to, to talk about this further, but I appreciate you taking time today to, to meet with me. Thanks. Thank you. As discussed in the episode, it's important to remember that we need to tie what we're teaching back to our course and program outcomes. We'll see how this impacts us as we go into the next episode, as we talk with Chelsea Gambles in the Family Life and Human Development Department here at SUU. In that episode, we're going to talk about pre-learning strategies that we as faculty can use to help prepare our students for tough conversations in the classroom. Join us next time on the SUU Teaching and Learning Podcast.